Hey guys, welcome to the Daily Word Bible Study, a plain and simple book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse study through the entire Bible. We are in Zechariah chapter 14, and we have been on a kind of lengthy excursion in this 14th chapter because of the prophecies concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're going to return back to the chapter. We're actually going to start it from, from ver chapter, verse 1 again. But we kind of gave an overview of the second coming and then also the rapture of the church. So that um, I wanted to fit that in. And, and now we're going to go back and we're going to talk about what Zechariah is presenting. In other words, what is the revelation of the prophecy? And that is when Jesus comes, what will he do when he comes? Because again, this is something that is, is prophesied clearly in scripture. Now, um, and again, I, I said because of this, and, and when we look at an Old Testament passage like this, it's important that we understand the, the, the prophecy. It's important we understand the revelation. It, what has happened over centuries is people have a, a based their prophecies, their, their view of end time prophecy on certain scriptures, but kind of not on all the scriptures. And, and you need that. As I often say, pro, end time prophecy as it's presented in scripture, is plain and simple to understand. Um, as with all the Bible, it's plain and simple to understand, but you gotta read it. But when it comes to end time prophecy, there it, it's exhaustive. There's a lot that you should digest. There's the continuity. So what we're gonna study here in Zechariah is the same revelation that Jesus talked about. It's just, Sometimes you get passages that give different views, angles, uh, give more or less details. And that's the difference. But the message is the same. So let's get into it. And as I said, we're going to go back to verse 1. And uh, so we talked about, again, what is the second coming? And it says here, a day of the Lord is coming. Now, the, the phrase day of the Lord always refers to a time and a period where God will judge the ungodly. So that, that's it in the nutshell, that God will judge the ungodly. So whenever you see this phrase, the day of the Lord, now it could refer to pretty much any day that doesn't necessarily have to apply to just the end time. So for example, the day of the Lord was also referred to Israel's judgment when Babylon came. Um, but as you can see, what it's going to have here, this is specifically on the event of leading up to the second coming of Jesus. Now, um, so he says, a day of the Lord is coming when your plunder will be divided in your presence. Um, let me go this quickly go to, I think I want Joel, Joel, and I'm going to have to find Joel, is it chapter 2? Here we go, this is one example of the day of the Lord, oh, not what I wanted here, uh, all right, I accidentally screened off, um, but anyway, this is Joel chapter 1. Joel chapter 1. Yes, so Joel chapter 1. And it says, verse 15, Woe because of that day. Um, let me see if we, uh, that other mention. Now, I'm, again, I kind of, I want to show you, um, I want to show you the, the, the usage of the phrase so that we can always know 
what is meant by the day of the Lord. It says right here, woe because of that day, for the day of the Lord is near and will come as devastation from the Almighty. Okay, so in Joel, some of this has a twofold fulfillment. One, the coming judgment from Babylon, and then the other will be the ultimate end times day of the Lord. So here is another phrase, chapter 2, verse 1 says, Blow the horn in Zion, sound the alarm in my holy mountain, let all the residents of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. In fact, it is near a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and dense overcast, like the uh, dawn spreading over the mountains. And then here, a great and strong people appears. Here talks about um, the coming of Babylon. And from this standpoint here, which is amazing, is about 200 plus years before it actually comes, and um, let me see if I can see one more use of the word, the day of the Lord. Um, all right, um, I can't find it, so I'll go back. So I think you see that. I, I think you get the point where. Um, here it is. Um, verse fourteen says. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near. In the valley of decision, the sun and the moon will grow dark and the stars will cease their shining. The Lord will war from Zion and raise his voice from Jerusalem. Heaven and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the Israel lights. Now that's going to be, now again, this prophecy, remember, was made some 200, some 200 and plus years before Babylon came and destroyed Jerusalem, the temple, and deported the Israelites. Zechariah is 70 years after those events, after the beginning of the, uh, the Babylon doom, their exile was 70 years. So 70 years plus after, here is another prophecy talking about the second coming or the day of the Lord. So then he says, a day of the Lord is coming when your plunder will be divided in your presence. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem for battle. Now this is specifically events doing what is called the Great Tribulation Period. Um, doing the uh, um, prelude to the second coming. So then he says, the day of the Lord is coming when your plunder will be divided in your presence. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem for battle. The city will be captured. Houses looted and the women raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the city will, uh, will, will not be removed from the city. But the rest of the people will not be removed from the city. If you remember Matthew uh, 24, uh, 15, Jesus said, when you see the abomination that called this desolation, flee to the mountain of Judea. So he's talking to the Israelites. And again, this e e Ezekiel 37 talks about the gathering, right? When you talk about the valley of the dry bones, but the gathering of all the nations at Jerusalem, uh, which, is, which is actually called uh, Megiddo, the Armageddon. I like the movies when they jump in a, when they jump into a a, a, a rocket and go destroy a <laughs> meteor. Anyway, um, verse three says the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as He fights on the day of battle. And right here we could see that this is the second coming is actually Jesus physically coming back to earth. Jesus physically coming back to earth. Every eye will see Him. Now, this is details of Jesus' return when every eye will see him in the sky. How do we know? Look, and the Lord will go out and fight against those nations that he fight on the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives will be split in half from east to west, forming a huge valley, so that half the mountain will move to the north and half to the south. 
and you will flee by my mountain valley, for the valley of the mountains will extend to Israel. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah the king. Then my Lord, my God, will come and all of his holy ones with him. So this picture here um, that we see, now we read several verses. And again, if you go back in the previous studies, the continuity of this day, which will come. Now this particular day here, which will come, every eye will see him. And in fact, Jesus' feet, notice, will set on the Mount of Olives. The mountains will split, okay? Notice this last statement, then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. So we can ask the question, who are the holy ones? Now, we, we're not going to go back into it about in terms of what the rapture is. And, we, and there, there, there are different views on the rapture. There are different views on the rapture. So we're not going to rehearse that. We already did. But um, I, but the fact that he says that the, the holy ones will come with him. Notice they are coming with him. They're not... And this event here, what makes this event different from the rapture of the church, as we said before, the rapture of the church is when Jesus himself comes from the church. We meet the Lord in the air, and we will always be with the Lord. Now, the argument comes, does this happen during this event? <laughs> okay, I don't believe so. But anyway, the Lord my God will come, and all of the holy ones with him. So then, so at the second coming, the holy ones are coming with Jesus. I do believe that this is the church. Verse 6 says, on that day, there will be no light. The sunlight and the moonlight will diminish. It will be a day known only to Yahweh without day or night. And there will be, and there will be light at evening. So he's describing in detail what's going to happen. It's going to come and then... Um, 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 you're going to see this, this kind of great battle. The purpose of this coming is Jesus is going to set up his kingdom. Um, let me kind of quickly go to, let me just show you in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, Daniel chapter 2. And let's skip down to, this was the interpretation of the dream. So I want you to pick, I'm going to pick it up in verse 42 says, and that the toes and the feet were partly iron and partly fired clay. Now this would be the 10 kingdoms. All right. Part of the kingdom will be strong and part will be brittle. You saw the iron mixed with clay, the peoples will mix it with one another and will not hold together, just as iron does not hold with fire clay. Now, this is the image that you saw, Daniel's image uh, of, go, of, of a human form representing five world-dominating kingdoms. The last kingdom, which is yet to arise, which would be that kingdom of the beast. So verse 44, he says, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed and this kingdom will not be left to another it will crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end but it will itself endure forever you saw a stone break out from the mountain without a hand touching it and it crushed iron bronze fired clay silver and gold so that's again what's going on here this is kind of details of what's going on here Jesus is coming and will set up his kingdom, starting with destroying the enemies of Israel. And then notice you're going to see, we're going to get a little, again, a little, just a little detail about what he's going to do when he sets down on Mount of Olives. Um, verse 8 says, on that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of it towards the eastern sea and the other half towards the western sea in summer and winter alike. So we kind of get of what is called the millennial reign. Jesus is going to come and rule for a thousand years. 
so we're getting some of the we're getting some of the details of what's going to happen. So to correspond this with Revelations chapter twenty, but in Je Revelation chapter twenty, it only mentions in terms of it doesn't give a lot of details other than that, for example, the dead will rise and reign with Christ for a thousand years. So here we're going to get we're getting a little more details about what this reign will be like. So um, notice here, verse nine says, "On that day, um, Yahweh will become king over all the earth. Yahweh alone, and His name alone, and the land from Giver to Rimen, uh, Rimen, Rimen, south of Jerusalem will be changed into a plain, but Jerusalem will be raised up, and will remain on its site." from the Benjamin gate to the place of the first gate to the corner gate and from the tower of uh, Haniel to the royal wine, uh, uh, wine press. And then he said, verse 11, and, the, and people will live there and never again will there be a curse of complete destruction. So Jerusalem will dwell in security. Um, so this second coming here gives us a little little detail about what will happen when Jesus comes again. So the day of the Lord is a is a conclusion of God's judging the earth with Jesus coming back and then setting up his earthly kingdom. So we get a little glimpse that it's going to be a kingdom in which um, it's going to be prosperity. Now, um, oh, let's see where, you know what? Let me show you in Revelations chapter 20. Let me show you in Revelations chapter 20. Uh, Revelations chapter 20. And now, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to go back and I'm going to read then uh, kind of chapter 19. Uh, okay. Okay. So let's get, kind of get a picture of what happens when Jesus is going to come. So let me read. Let me go back. Now, we, in verse 11 says, Then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse. Its right is called faithful and true, and he judges and makes war in righteousness. His eyes were like a flaming, uh, fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. His robe was stained with blood, and his name was the word of God. And get this, the armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses, wearing pure white linen. So again, who are these armies right here? Personally, I believe it is the church, but okay. But he said the sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will shepherd them with a rock, an, an iron scepter, and he will trample the winepress of the fierce anger of, of God Almighty. And his name is written, he had a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw the angel standing on the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds flying overhead, come gather, your, gather together for the great supper, of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of commanders, and the flesh of mighty men, uh, and the flesh of horses, uh, and their riders, and the flesh of everyone, both free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the beast, um, I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and against his armies. How stupid they will be, but. But the beast was taken uh, taken prisoner, and along with him the false prophet who had performed signs in his presence. He deceived those who had who accepted the mark uh, of the beast and those who worship his image uh, with these signs. Both of them were cast alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. And I saw an angel coming down from from heaven, and had the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He seized the dragon 
that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. This is where we get the millennial reign. He threw him into an abyss, clothed and put a seal upon it, so that he would no longer deceive the nations until a thousand years were complete. After that, he must be released for a thousand years. I saw thrones and people seated on them uh, who were given authority to judge. I also saw people who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of God's word, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received this mark, uh, who had not accepted this mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with the Messiah for a thousand years. So I'm going to stop there because this is now, it's kind of, we, we get an inkling of what the um, a thousand years will be. They're going to reign with him. So obviously we're going to get into this next time. Um, we're getting into this and continue this second coming. What is actually going on in the second coming of Jesus Christ? Don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP The Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. I'll see you in the next study.